I'm excited today to talk to you about uh, how you could you know, bridge the classic world of machine learning kind of pipelines with the world of LLMs. Uh, for those of you who are online uh, and, and listening, um, I'm just going to publish a quick poll just to, would be great if you could answer just to give us a bit of a sense of you know, who you are. Uh, uh, and then otherwise, uh, in terms of just a little bit while you're answering that, a little bit about us, uh, Elijah and I you know, collectively have almost 25 years of experience building kind of machine learning and, and data platform systems. Uh, I I've spent most of my career in Silicon Valley, Elijah as well. Also, he spent some time in New York. Uh, we worked together at Stitch Fix for a long time, and that's where uh, you know some of the you know, learnings uh, Ed, that will imbue on you come come from at Stitch Fix, building um, uh, tools for over 100 data scientists. One of the things that we built there, and the only thing that we open sourced was Hamilton, uh, and then we you know uh, decided to start a company around it. Uh, for the oh, thank you for everyone for for answering the poll. Some results coming in. Uh, it's useful. Uh, I see most people. Uh, uh, are using um, uh, ML, others are, you know, just uh, starting to do uh, LLMs. Cool. Uh, so LLMs, you know, roughly a year ago, no one really knew <laughs> what these were, but in the last year, this this kind of space has been on fire, right? Um, it, it's so, uh, it's very nascent, uh, very hot topic, and so in which case, you know, uh, for those of you who, who know kind of classic ML uh, or, or, or dabbling with, with uh, going straight to LLMs, the, you might be trying to think, you know, is there, uh, are these two things the same uh, or are they uh, pretty different? Uh, and so in this talk, we hope we'll give you two things. One is a mentor model uh, to help kind of, you know, uh, mentally how equate these two things uh, and how they're kind of, you know, pretty similar. Uh, and then also a tool set uh, that you can use for both, which is Hamilton, which will be, uh, you know, the second part of the talk. Uh, so in this first part, I really just want to imbue you, uh, leave you with some sort of mental model uh, that roughly equates, you know, machine learning pipelines with, with LM ones uh, so, and by doing that, um, and, and I guess one thing to note is this is a 25-minute talk. So, uh, and we have two parts, so we aren't going to dive too deeply into things. Um, but, uh, and so, which case, you know, apologize that uh, if you're looking for something a little deeper. But um, otherwise, let, let's compare some pipelines to kind of uh, see how you know we can equate these two kind of uh, worlds. Uh, first, let's start with inference. Uh, uh, say we have you know an LTV, uh, we're trying to do long-term value prediction. Uh, which is a classic ML kind of case, and say we're doing some text summarization. Uh, to do inference here from a pipeline, a lot of things you, you think about and you need to do, you know, they're pretty similar. Uh, you need some inputs, and one, you you, fit, you do feature engineering, the other one, you, you uh, pass things into a prompt, you then pass it to uh, a model, and then you get some output. Uh, looks pretty similar, right? Um, the one thing to note, though, is, you know, there really isn't any feature engineering, uh, so to speak, uh, with uh, LMs. Instead, you kind of have this, uh, you know, prompt that you kind of then fill in with some sort of context. In terms of you know what actually constitutes a model, right? This is where I think the two words are uh, uh, you know mo the most different. Uh, in the classic case, you have uh, some weights and some features that represent a model. In the LLM, it's really uh, world. It's like a, a prompt template that you fill with text along with an LLM uh, foundational model paired together constitutes a a model. Um, uh, uh, and because of like uh, you know, it, it, therefore it's uh, a new model is just a matter of tweaking, you know, a, a template. And so the way that I like to think about it is uh, a prompt template is a bit like a hyperparameter. Um, and so together with an API, you get a model, right? Um, and because of that, the iteration pace, it's much different. Uh, so within the LLM world, it's much easier to, to get to production and build something versus in the classic kind of ML case. Um, but in terms of one things are in production, you still have the same kind of concerns. So how do you version the model? How do you know what's in production? How do you understand, you know, what it was today versus, you know, six months ago if you're like looking for, for changes, right? Uh, you still have the same observability and evaluation needs. So making sure that the output matches your expectations, uh, having the same observability on the inputs to help you debug things, and then obviously connecting uh, the outputs with some sort of, you know, uh, business metric or something that you need to ev evaluate to ensure that actually, you know, uh, not that they're only doing things correctly, but then also that they're uh, moving things in the right direction for you and your business. Uh, in terms of deployment or you know uh, serving infrastructure, et cetera, like there's nothing really new here. You know, uh, people were already dealing with APIs for inference. Uh, uh, the only real kind of uh, um, uh, difference is that if you're doing any LLM stuff or you're trying to host stuff internally, you're going to need GPUs. Whereas in the, the classic world, you could you know get away with just CPUs. But you know, with d deep learning and such, you know, people have already been using GPUs uh, for serving uh, for a while. In terms of training. Um, uh, at a high level with LMs, there really isn't uh, you know much training because uh, you may be doing this you know hyperparameter tuning where you're you know tweaking a prompt, 
but in in in, in the simplest case, there really isn't uh, you know a training pipeline per se um, uh, with with LMs. Whereas compared to classic you know ML to create a new model, you need this kind of pipeline to to fit a, a model. Uh, but eventually, anyone who's doing LMs is probably going to be doing some fine tuning. This then had looks pretty similar in terms of the pipeline or the structure that you would set up to you know train a classic model. Um, you know, uh, difference being, you know, there really isn't any feature engineering, but you, you do need, you know, some sort of labeled inputs and outputs to, to uh, then be able to uh, uh, fit a model, right, which isn't too different from the classic case. Uh, note, though, um, uh, you know, evaluation is fuzzier with LMs, so you're dealing with text. Those who come from an NLP background, uh, you know, uh, know this isn't really anything too new. Uh, but uh, in terms of time spent, if you're going to be doing this stuff, you're going to be spending a lot more time evalu on evaluation and trying to get that right with LMs than, than, than say, the classic case, as it were. Uh, and then from a training perspective, you need GPUs if you're ever going to do anything with LLMs yourself, whereas in the class classic case, you could get away with just CPUs. Um, just to compare as something more complex, so a recommendation system versus, say, a retrieval augmented generation system. So example of that is, say, Stitch Fix, where they were recommending close. It was a recommendation system for it. Uh, in the LLMs, you might be doing a knowledge, you know, question answering kind of uh, use case. Um, both of these, you know, actually look pretty similar in structure. Again, um, nothing really too new. Both of them, you have some sort of query that then you're getting some candidates set for. And one, it's, you know, uh, items to kind of rank and feature engineer. The other is to get features for. And then the other is, you know, taking some text, getting an embedding and finding, you know, some more documents. You're then, you know, uh, potentially ranking, filtering them and then passing it to a model that then kind of spits out an output. Um, and so uh, the, in the model in the classic case, you know, re-ranks all the items potentially. Uh, but in an LLM, you're, you're, you're providing that as input and, the, and then the, the LLM is figuring out, you know, what to use from that to then, you know, uh, provide an output. You have the same productionization concerns that you need an engineer for, right? Uh, you need you have the same kind of debugging concerns, observability, evaluation. So you need the same kind of hooks and some systems in place to you know, understand whether things are working. Uh, you need to connect this with some sort of data store, uh, feature stores, a vector database or database. You know, um, vector databases aren't actually anything new. They've actually existed in the classic world, right? Uh, they just come to the forefront since you know uh, um, uh, uh, since yeah, there's a, a larger need for them uh, in in the LLM case. And then you're going to be backing uh, these up with some sort of ETL or uh, extract transform load process or pipeline to you know feed in and uh, you know take items and create features and then in the LM case you know say take PDFs embed them uh, and put them into a place that you can then you know search over them. Um, uh, in, in terms of the classic world, you know, to get something to production, classically requires a lot, a lot of engineering. It's a famous paper by Google uh, that kind of shows uh, the point being that you know, your machine learning code is pretty small. But uh, you, you have to engineer and write a lot of other software uh, to kind of you know get this kind of machine learning stuff uh, to production, um, and so uh, invariably this this still uh, uh, you know uh, you, there's still the problem of you know pipeline inheritance. So most people don't like inheriting someone else's uh, machine learning pipeline code, right? And it's um, because of this kind of uh, uh, requirement of you still have to engineer a lot. Uh, our kind of you know high level take on this is you know what we've seen at Stitch Fix in our careers is that. Usually, this is uh, because you know people have over-engineered abstractions, or um, they essentially make it hard to a uh, test uh, quickly that you are changing something you're not going to impact something downstream. Uh, it's going to be hard for you to potentially swap out a component or you know uh, make things kind of uh, uh, modular. Uh, and then in, in machine learning, uh, you know, with say feature engineering, you know, how do you make sure that you can classically or easily kind of reuse things? This can this uh, can become pretty difficult. Uh, if you're dealing with you know kind of custom in-house uh, abstractions that most people uh, end up engineering, in the LLM world, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't really simplify any of this kind of software engineering requirement. Right, the things that you kind of want to add uh, for into your pipelines are going to be uh, you know similarly require just amount the same amount of engineering. Uh, the space is is pretty nascent, as I said, it's only really been around a year, and already people have you know uh, reacted to over-engineered abstractions that you know made it hard to. Uh, quickly test and be confident in something, but then also uh, uh, you know uh, change something. For example, classically prompts uh, and you know swap things out uh, as you need to. So, for example, vector databases. Um, uh, choosing your abstraction here can really you know hinder uh, what you can do, and especially if the uh, as the field has been moving pretty quickly, uh, this is something that uh, people have been uh, facing. In terms of um, uh, so, this is where you know directed a like at grass, Kevin. Um, I think you know. Hopefully, I've shown you from a pipeline perspective structurally things are pretty similar, and yet they also uh, with LLMs and classic ML, you still need you know uh, you have a software engineering challenge. Um, 
uh, and so let's talk about now how we can kind of think about unifying uh, uh, more easily, more, more closely unified classic ML with LMs, uh, as well as work to solve you know the software engineering challenges, as we'll kind of see, um, which Hamilton kind of helps you with uh, by modeling things as directed acyclic graphs uh, uh, or, or DAGs. Uh, for those who don't know what a directed acyclic graph is or, or a DAG, it's effectively you know, a concept of nodes and edges. Uh, where nodes uh, represent computation uh, and an edge represents, you know, the flow of what happens to be computed uh, beforehand. Uh, in general, uh, I want to say DAGs are everywhere uh, in the code you write. So here I have some uh, procedural pandas code. It is, in fact, can be modeled as a directed acyclic graph, right? Um, uh, so you can see here we're, you know, creating columns and appending it to a data frame. Uh, uh, this can uh, kind of uh, this computation can be modeled as a directed acyclic graph. Uh, uh, pretty easily. And this is, a, in fact, what your kind of compiler is kind of doing under the hood uh, anyway, um, or interpreter. Uh, if you have, if you are using, if, if you're not new to the world of LMs and you've used a library such as Langchain, um, you know, it has some, you know, makes it pretty easy to get something up and running. Uh, it is, in fact, you know, just effectively uh, 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 stitching together a few function calls uh, to create a directed acyclic graph as well. Um, uh, it, Moving on to, uh, you know, just to kind of prove the point a bit more. So um, machine learning pipelines, you can draw this kind of diagram of structure of like what's supposed to happen to kind of fit in you know, uh, a model. Uh, classically, you would then uh, implement this in production uh, in something, an orchestration system like Airflow, which in fact forces you to also model this as a directed acyclic graph. Um, uh, but what's happening within these steps, right, uh, is actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, ML pipelines are in fact a DAG of DAGs, uh, where you're at a macro level, you're scheduling, you know, extracting some data, creating a training set, fitting a model, doing inference. In each one of these steps, you're in fact, you know, uh, your code is actually, you know, uh, uh, can be modeled internally as, as, as this kind of micro DAG uh, as well. And so this transfers over to uh, the LM pipeline world. So in the case of the RAG example, each one of these discrete kind of computational steps, again, can be broken down into you know, some sort of series of micro DAGs. Uh, uh, and, and so it, to kind of you know, round out this, this part of the talk, um, hopefully I've kind of shown you that uh, at a high level, uh, the you know, LLM pipelines are pretty broadly equivalent to classic ML ones. Uh, you have the same shared software engineering challenges and productionization concerns uh, to a large extent. Uh, but the you know, point to take home with our LAMs is that applications can be developed much faster. Uh, and in fact, your pipelines will have to uh, need to be adjusted to be able to change more quickly as the field is kind of progressing. Uh, I briefly blew through the DAG section, but at its core, you know, um, you know, classic ML and LLMs can workflows or pipelines uh, can be modeled as directed acyclic graphs. And so my hot take here uh, is that um, a DAG is all you need. Right? And so in terms of abstraction, if you're writing code and you can't represent it and it's not easily represented as a DAG, then the rest of uh, that is an over-engineered abstraction. Over to you, Elijah. Thank you. You just need that call. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, the riskiest part of any talk. But I think I got it. All right. Thanks, Stefan. So in part one, we talked about the mental model uh, and justified why DAGs our favorite word, our really good abstraction for this. In this part, we're going to talk about some tooling that can help you get started with DAGs. So we're going to talk about the tool we created called Hamilton and how you can use it to represent both ML and LLM pipelines. All right, so what is Hamilton? Well, I'm going to throw at you a definition that's got a lot of words here. So Hamilton is a micro orchestration framework for defining DAGs using declarative functions. And we're going to go over each one of these pieces in detail. But the whole goal of it is to give you a bunch of sort of software engineering best practices and make them really easy. So make it easy for you to build highly testable, self-documenting pipelines that are very modular and encourage reuse. It's all open source. You can install it on PyPy. Uh, the package is called SF Hamilton because it came from Citrix where it used to work. And you can try it out uh, online at tryhamilton.dev and run it in the browser so you don't need to install anything. There's a link to this in the chat too. Cool. So uh, as Stefan went over, micro-orchestration versus macro-orchestration. Uh, macro-orchestration handles this whole thing. You might know tools such as Airflow, um, Metaflow, they're going to be speaking right after us, that think sort of a macro-orchestration level. Micro-orchestration handles what happens inside these steps. So the actual logic, how the data flows, how it's transformed, and where it's saved, that's all the micro-orchestration piece. 
Again, uh, we showed this, but to hammer home, Hamilton DAGs rep replace procedural codes. We have these operations on a data frame. You might be very familiar with this in, term, in a feature engineering context. You're making sort of these monolithic changes. This can actually be represented as a directed acyclic graph. You can see uh, to calculate spend mean, all you need to know is spend, and to calculate spend zero mean, all you need to know is spend mean and spend. You don't need to know the other ones. So you have an implicit ordering with a natural set of dependencies that represents this computation. Cool. So in Hamilton, uh, we deal with declarative functions. And functions declare A, what they create in the DAG, and B, what dependencies are required for computation. So you can, but you don't have to run these functions directly. Uh, and in Hamilton, you don't actually. Uh, and when you read the function, the idea is you should be able to understand everything about it, what it does and what it needs and how it works. So this is a notion we call internally, they're called uh, named pieces of business logic. The idea is every component of your DAG should be nice and self-contained and really give you a sense of exactly what's happening. So talked about what it is. Uh, it actually came from a very specific problem that you've probably all seen before, which is that of debugging a data frame. Data frames are often created using a series of complex code and transformations. And we were having a lot of trouble figuring out exactly what happened, why one column was wrong. So we wanted to re sort of rethink the world and come up with a way to compute this data frame. The idea was simple. What if every column or every output column in this case corresponded to exactly one Python function? And what if you could determine the dependencies from the way that that function was written? So a one-to-one -one mapping of function to column. That's how we came up with Hamilton. The, in Hamilton, the output, sort of the column in this case, but it actually works for more than just data frames and series, is determined by the name of the function. And its dependencies are determined by the input parameter. So uh, to turn it into a node, you take the function name, that's the node, and the dependencies form the edges. Therein is a DAG. Uh, this isn't actually new to Hamilton. If you've seen PyTest fixtures, I think they came before. It uses the exact same sort of terminology. There's sort of a structure and Dagster software defined assets came afterwards, which uses a similar concept. So uh, how does this compare to the procedural code we showed you before? Well, instead of writing it line by line where you're uh, managing a monolithic data frame, you declare each step as a function that handles a specific set of data, right? So in this case, instead of doing DFC equals DFA plus DFB, DFD equals some transform, you define C and D. C depends on A and B, and D depends on C. And this is sort of the entire set of code you need to write. All right. So what does the full hello world look like? Well, we've defined our functions in the step before, and we have something called a driver that tells you what and when to execute. So we handle the module. So first you import your module that we defined above, then you instantiate your driver, pass it some data and the module. Uh, next, you actually execute it. You say which nodes you want. And Hamilton's smart enough to just execute the ones you want upstream. And finally, you've got the result. So this is the full hello world. You can copy this code and run it in Hamilton, and it should be pretty easy. There's a lot more to the framework as well. Uh, we won't go sort of in depth into this. Um, but we have a bunch of decorators that sort of form higher level operations on top of functions. So you can attach metadata to your functions. You can repeat them with different parameters. Uh, you can do data validation. The only one that will be useful for the rest of this talk is called config.when. And the idea is you can sort of do tra conditional transforms. So have uh, one, trans one function included in the DAG in one case and one included in the DAG in another case and be able to swap between them. Remember, Hamilton is also sort of a new way of writing Python functions, but it isn't opinionated about the tools you use to scale and has all sorts of natural integrations with a bunch of them. So you can use any sort of Python object, run Hamilton in any Python context, and we've seen things from running uh, Hamilton on Spark, Ray, Dask, Flask, Fast API, Flask, Jupyter Notebook. The world is your oyster here. Cool. So let's go over some examples. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we can do use Hamilton for sort of more classic ML, then for an LLM pipeline, then for a combination of both. All right. So let's dive into feature engineering here. The high level is, or let's dive into machine learning and focus a bit on feature engineering, uh, sort of feature engineering plus. The high level is that we're going to define one function per feature. So they're nice and self-contained. You have sort of modular unit testable components. Join them together and run them as part of the Hamilton driver. Utilize this config.when decorator I talked about to swap between online and offline implementations and expand out to more components of the machine learning lifecycle. Okay, so here are some features. 
You've probably seen code that looks like this because uh, it's just operations on a Pandas series, but now we've got them broken out into nice clean functions that you can use in a lot of different places. In this case, uh, these form a DAG together and as part of a bigger DAG, create our sort of whole feature engineering pipeline, which might be one of those steps in the macro orchestration framework. But now we've got it nicely uh, put together. We can figure out exactly what's happening and we can understand lineage from a very fine grained perspective. Note that if we have some features that might be different between batch and online, say you're querying a service online and you're loading a table in batch, we can use config.when to switch between the two modes. In this case, we get our survey result data from different cases offline, from different uh, locations offline and online. And we have client login data that we get from a service online and load up a table in batch. All right. So you can use this to keep most of the feature engineering pipelines the same for the map functions that we saw before for the sort of the simple uh, series to series functions. And for the more complicated ones, you can switch them out. Then it gets pretty easy to add pieces on top of this. So you can add in machine learning uh, inference and training as needed. In this case, I'm kind of making a joke here and just instantiating a model for training it. But you would imagine that due to sort of the modularity and ease of putting new pieces in the DAG, you can uh, train your model and then do predictions right after that. Cool. Let's talk about how this works for LLM pipelines. Well, if you're familiar with uh, sort of common LLM terminology, um, you'll notice that you'll notice that there's sort of an idea called chains, which is sort of little components that you can call together. Uh, we're calling those capabilities, but the idea is you define these capabilities or chains as DAGs, and nodes, the functions, can form prompts, API calls, external data queries, data transformation, really whatever. It's all just sort of written in Python, and you can sort of bring your own abstractions or bring your own tools. And then you can sort of tie them together with a control flow uh, that you create, or sort of an agent. They can take the result and feed it to the next execution, so manage state, or maybe even use an LLM to decide which DAG and how to run the next one, and sort of go from there, building out more complex stateful systems. You can swap out between foundational models, vector stores, et cetera, all with config.one. So what does this look like? Here's a pretty simple DAG to capture an image. And I know this is a lot of code, but I'm hoping it's pretty easy to understand as to what's happening here. We're creating a prompt and then passing it to OpenAI, right? You've probably all written, all sort of seen code that looks something like this. Uh, and we've got another one for generating an image, right? Take a prompt, generate the image from the prompt and save the image out. Pretty simple. Cool. So we've got these and these start to form a toolbox, right? Of different little DAGs that can be used for different LLM capabilities. So you can select which DAG to execute based on the context, where you are in the application or what's happened previously. Run in the process and do something with outputs. Display them to the user, store a state and context, and feed back to the next execution. Even write back to storage for fine tuning later. Really, you can do whatever you want. It's just these sort of like building blocks. You can even do what I did and embrace some chaos. Feed a caption from ChatGPT to an image generator in Dali with a while loop and two lines of Hamilton code, blog post coming soon about this, and end up with something really cool. Uh, I was just having fun with this yesterday. So, all right. So now let's take a brief uh, look at how you might even combine LLMs and ML together. And many problems you hit will require both. For instance, say we want to customize embeddings. We want to pass pairs of similar and dissimilar text that we consider for sort of our space. Query a foundational model for the embeddings. Train a model on those pairs and then project your embeddings onto that space. All right. This is actually comes from the OpenAI cookbook. You download all this code online we have uh, in the new thing called the Hamilton Hub that we'll share shortly. And the idea here, um, you don't have to really get too into depth into this because I just put a big pretty DAG to uh, show some eye candy. But you're in this case, we're doing both sort of querying a foundational model and training a model using classic ML. You can swap in and out pieces, uh, use ML for one piece, use LM for other pieces. It's all nice and modular and broken into components. The idea is to use them for both, uh, both LLM and MLs, allows you to bring your own tooling, choose which piece you want for which specific job, swap out the components, implementations, et cetera, visualize, test, and reuse all those different components as I showed before, and do all of this with one tool where you can delegate to whatever other tools you might need. So you're avoiding the sort of over-engineered abstraction. All right. So in summary about Hamilton, uh, we wanted to argue, or we were arguing that modeling your DAG as self-descriptive functions allows you, it sort of affords you a lot, right? You can use the same tooling for LLM, ML, and data processing, so you're not reinventing the wheel every time you switch between them. 
You can rerun in multiple contexts to save code and headaches, reuse DAGs to build really cool thing, things, and build all of the above as modular, testable, self-documenting software. The goal is to never fear inheriting somebody else's code. So taking a look back on everything we talked about, uh, the mental model section, pipelines, uh, LLM pipelines are broadly equivalent to classic MLs, that's what we were arguing. But the LLM field is moving, change, changing quickly. While traditional machine learning isn't going away, you're going to need pipelines that you can easily swap out pieces and manage and build quickly. You can model ML pipelines as DAGs as well as LLM pipelines. And we would argue that it is in fact both sufficient and necessary to build a really sort of like strong, uh, well-modeled system. Hamilton can be your unifying tool set for this. Uh, software engineering best practices for free and can do both large language models and LLMs and is meant to handle change. So you can easily swap out components, develop it and make changes and test them against each other. So next steps, uh, you can download Hamilton on PyPy, go to ha try Hamilton to dev, all these links are in the chat. Go to the hub, uh, hub.divers.io to get started with something quickly. Star the repository on GitHub. Uh, we appreciate it. Let us know that people are interested and join Slack if you have any questions. Uh, we also have, are going to be around later to answer questions and are in the chat. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and we would love to hear any questions. Feel free to reach out to us. Stefan and Elijah, thanks so much for that great talk. So we'll just give it a sec here to see if there's any questions that show up. Um, that was a lot of information you covered there. So, yeah, yeah. we were slightly ambitious with with what we wanted to cover, <laughs> but you did, it. you did it. It's great. Oh, there's something that's coming in Q and A. Did I see that? Or, yeah, could you transform a Hamilton DAG into a, something, for example, an Airflow DAG? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can, you there are multiple. Yeah, I'll take this. There are multiple ways. This is actually something we've been working on a lot recently. There are multiple ways you could do it. Uh, the easiest way is to sort of take a subset of the DAG, load data from one place, and write it to another place. And then you have an abstraction where you don't actually have to think about Airflow. The next thing we're thinking about is, and so that you can write like, you can call out the Hamilton inside Airflow, and that's effectively transforming it. The next thing we're thinking about is uh, building actual compilers that could take a Hamilton DAG and compile it to Airflow. And then you could say compile it to Metaflow or Dagster later on. Yeah, I, I just we have a blog actually on how you can use Hamilton with Metaflow. So this is what uh, the first step of like how you can combine the two. But yeah, it's on the kind of the roadmap of like how can we yeah allow you to group a, a, a set of nodes into one computational task and then you know help generate the um, the, the Airflow code uh, that will then run the Hamilton code for it. That's a good question. Thanks, Simon. Excellent. Well, if there's uh, no more questions at this time, there was, sorry, there's something that came in. Can you see that in chat? If you want to take a quick. Yeah. So I think if I understand correctly, the conversation yeah. is, yeah, the question is Hamilton brings added value to the LLM and how does it work, uh, but largely to the chain of operations. That's what we're focusing on now. So uh, one thing we found is that like, we, we like to talk about over-engineered abstractions. Agents sound really cool, but I think the biggest thing that people need right now is sort of well-structured code that uh, is resilient towards failure and Hamilton can help give you that. Um, and then we have sort of more abstract, more things we're working on in the sort of agent space that I alluded to um, that we're gonna be developing soon. Yeah, yeah. so like, uh, um, yeah, the 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 uh, Hamilton helps structure, you know, the capability of the thing you want an agent to do. We've also found that most people, for most of the purposes, when they want to go to production, end up really heavily customizing an agent as well. And so in which case, there really hasn't been an abstraction that uh, fits well for them other than, you know, a Hello World demo. Uh, but, you know, if you have, you know, use cases or, or feedback, you know, we'd, we'd love to learn from you and see how, you know, we could, uh, you know, build something on top of Hamilton, for example, that is more agent-based that then, you know, um, uh, fulfills that kind of requirement. Great. Thank you. So with that, um... Thank you everybody for coming to the session. Thank you, Elijah and Stefan for that uh, great presentation. And to everyone here, uh, enjoy the rest of PyData Global. Take care and we'll end the session there. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. much.